Welcome to Let's Connect Greater Portland, a show about the changes and challenges we face and the great things that people are doing to make Greater Portland a fantastic place. I'm Christina Egan, your host. Today, we've got a very exciting episode. I'm here with Patricia Campos Mello. Patricia is an award winning investigative journalist from Brazil who has covered conflicts and elections around the globe. She was recently featured in an HBO documentary called Endangered, where she tells the story of how former President Bolsonaro of Brazil targeted her on social media after she wrote about disinformation during his presidential campaign. She sued the former president and won. Today, we'll hear her story and get her thoughts on how journalism in Maine helps strengthen democracy. I'm also joined by Kathy Lee. She's the manager of Lee International, which does climate work around the globe. And she's also the founder of Justice for Women. I'm so glad to have both of you here. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful to be here. Great to have you. And Kathy, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Patricia, we're going to, before we dive in really deeply, I wanted to just ask you, what brings you to Portland, Maine? Um, I had the luck to be invited by Kathy Lee to participate in the Justice for uh, Women series, which is, I mean, she's going to explain it much better. But um, I talked to high, high school students and I met many Mainers and new Mainers and I gave a lecture last night. And it's basically a really good opportunity to talk about our work in the Global South and how women are doing uh, what we're trying to do and get in touch with, with such nice people as people from Maine. I was saying I, I lived in New York last year. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I really love New York, but you can't Mainers compare. Better. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is so much nicer, seriously. <laughs> yeah, it is a very nice group of people. I'm glad that you found us nice. It's just so great to be able to talk about your experience in the Global South and how it relates to Maine. I don't think everybody understands how close-knit we are on this earth, and it's just uh, wonderful to have your experience here. So thank you. And Kathy, um, so you brought Patricia here. Tell us a little bit about Justice for Women. Thank you. It's a program I founded 12 years ago and approached the law school and asked if they were interested in being the home for this program. It's a week of events. The culmination is this big lecture at Hannaford Hall, which we did last night, which is live stream, but also um we were face to face for the first time in three years. But the part that is so near and dear to my heart is the what I refer to as the community piece. The speaker gives a lecture but spends the rest of the week meeting primarily with young people. High school students, we went to Brunswick High, Deering High, Tree Street Youth, youth programs, in order for them to have an opportunity to see a powerful woman who's making change in the world. And that's what the program is. It's once a year. Mm -hmm. And great. Spreading inspiration. Yeah, that exactly. sounds so great. So, Patricia, I would imagine that most of the people that are listening today probably haven't been to Brazil. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from and what it's like there? Sure. I am from Sao Paulo. It's a huge city in Brazil, 18 million inhabitants. I mean, it's very, very large to many people. And, and Brazil is uh, an emerging economy. It's a democracy. I mean, we almost... Uh, did become an authoritarian country last year, um, but we had very difficult elections. Um, former President Jair Bolsonaro was running against also former President uh, uh, Lula, and, and Lula won. But we had four difficult years with a populist, uh, extreme right-wing leader governing the country. Um, what else about Brazil? I mean, it's well, huge. It has the Amazon. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on. And I know that election that just happened this fall in Brazil was actually in the top of the fold newspapers here just because of the implications of um, having an authoritarian government president, presidential candidate, you know, running against a different candidate and what the impact could be for foreign relations. So, it's um it's it's great to see uh, that you were holding those politicians accountable, and we're definitely going to get into that. Um, but I want to learn a little bit more about your journey first. Like, why did you become a journalist? Um, well, I always it was my passion to uh, listen to people's stories, to understand their lives, 
And um, also my father was a war correspondent. He was a photographer, photojournalist. So I had uh, this life. I mean, I saw him working and I thought, this is so amazing what he's doing. He covered, you know, many wars. He was kidnapped in the Gulf War. Thank God he was released. He was released. All good. Um, but at the same time, I thought he's never home. It's such a tough job. He, you know, there's no, the salary is not good. So I resisted. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I mean, I even applied to law school. I went to law school for a year. It's undergrad in Brazil. But then I, I just had to, uh, you know. There's some is, calling in you. Yes. It's it's just, it's such an interesting job. It's such a privilege to be a reporter. Yeah. And, and what is it really that calls you to do the work? Is it, it can't just be interesting because there are lots of jobs that are interesting, but there must be something that makes you feel like you need to do this. Or, I mean, even simpler things like you find such amazing people living in difficult conditions and it's it's so nice to be able to be a, a medium for them to tell their stories. So I think that that is something that is, is really, um, I know it's not often, but sometimes we can make a difference. It sounds like you have. And I would love to know a little bit more about some of the issues that you've covered around the world, I know you you are a journalist in Brazil, but you've also been covering stories around um, Africa and in the United States and other places, and some of the issues that you've been really diving deep into. I was a foreign correspondent uh, based in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. for four and a half years. That was 2006 to 2010. And for many years, even before that, I was covering refugees, migration, and, and conflict. So one of the projects we did was called the World, A World of Walls, which is we went to four continents, countries in four continents, to show where walls or fences were being built to keep refugees out, to show, you know, who are the refugees? What are they trying to escape from? And why are people reacting like this with uh, fences and, and walls? So I, I did a lot of um, coverages about that. I traveled to you know Libya, Iraq, Syria, Kenya, many places. And I'm still doing this. I'm going to Ukraine next month. Very much looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to uh, be there with local journalists, Ukrainian journalists, uh, who want to show the reality of what's going on in, in the ground, on the ground. It's um, in a few countries around the world, including Brazil and some countries in Africa and uh, other countries in Latin America. Russian propaganda is very strong. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting initiative to take uh, journalists from these emer emerging countries to see for themselves what's happening in the war. So this is something I'm, I'm doing next month and I really look forward to so let's dive a little bit into what you found when you were interviewing refugees in some of these different countries. In Maine, we have a lot of new people that are coming specifically from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Angola and some from Haiti and other places around the world. What did you learn when you were doing those stories about why people are leaving their own countries and moving to other places? Um, first, I just wanted to mention that I had the privilege of speaking to many uh, Angolan and Congolese students uh, in uh, at Deering High School and Brunswick High School. And this was amazing. I mean, their stories. And this question you just asked, I, I, I posed the same question to myself when, not sure if you're going to remember, but a few years ago, there was a picture of this little boy in a red shirt facing down. He had drowned uh, trying to escape from Syria to Turkey to go on to Europe, right? And I saw that, and I mean, before, his name was Alan Kurdi, before him, so many other little boys had drowned trying to escape wars or poverty or uh, all that. And and no one, you know, but this time we saw the picture and everybody uh, immediately could identify, you know, this could be my son, this could be someone I know. So I went to Syria 
to understand exactly what were uh, his parents trying to escape from, right? Why would you put your, I think he was like five year old, five years old, your five year old in a boat in a very dangerous journey, you know, people are dying, people are drowning, but it's still, it's such a horrible situation that you're willing to face the risk. Uh, so I went to his city, I interviewed his uh, grandparents to understand, and I mean, these people, they're not, it's not tourism, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, seriously, I yeah. mean, you, you really, like, the, the Angolans uh, and the Congolese who, uh, whom we met at the high schools, I mean, they cross 14 countries, Sometimes 14. on foot, you know, the forest, they call it the forest, which is the daddy in, uh, in, in Panama, right? Uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's, they're heroes. I mean, how do you get here, right? So it takes a lot of grit. Oh, yeah. Right? A lot of grit to leave everything that you know, and there must be real reasons why you have to leave. Exactly, exactly. So um, it's, it's very important for us to understand and to have some empathy to really understand what these people were trying to escape from, what are the, the living conditions they are in. But at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge that, of course, there is an impact when you have uh, immigrants in a community. So it's also necessary to work together with the government, you know, to improve infrastructure so that it's good, the, the, service, the public service is still good to everybody, right? So I think it's, uh, the main thing is to understand that these are people exactly like us. They just were born in a different country from a different family, and this is not their fault at all. Yeah, it was the luck of the draw or the unluck of the draw. You were hearing from Patricia Campos Mello, who is an award-winning investigative journalist from Brazil that it's an absolute honor to have on the show. We're also here with Kathy Lee of Lee International, uh, who does a lot of climate work globally. So we have two people working globally with us today. If you'd like to join our conversation, call in at 780-4909, again, 780-4909, and you're listening to Let's Connect Greater Portland. I'm your host, Christina Egan. Kathy, I want to turn to you a little bit about what's next. So Patricia has been spending this week here. She's sp spoken with high school students and people that have immigrated here to Maine. What are you thinking about uh, how Justice for Women can amplify the work that uh, Patricia has done this week? She's made it very easy to do that. I mean, we will do our best to publicize the lecture. But the really exciting thing is out of her visits to the high schools, she came up with the idea of getting the stories of some of these Angolan and Congolese kids that she met. Um, and so she's proposed that we do interviews. She'll do some, I'll do some, and we'll get them published in the newspaper in Portuguese in Brazil and in English here in Maine. And it's a way of helping people here to understand who these kids really are, the trauma they've been through. But they, they were so excited to tell their stories. I mean, she obviously makes everybody want to talk to her. It's I amazing she, to watch she her in action. To, she told me before the show that she likes asking questions more than answering them. Right. <laughs> so it would be great to have that. But they were, yeah, I mean, they were super excited. The idea that we had, me and Kathy, is to have them... Uh, writing accounts in first person. So we would interview them, but to transform it in first person accounts because they really, they really heroes. Can you imagine crossing 14 countries and like m most of it on foot? It's, it's so hard to even wrap your head around what that must be like. Yeah, telling us that they were stepping over dead bodies. Yeah. There's one, one family with six kids whose mother died on the journey and they had to leave her body behind. I mean, they arrive here. Imagine the trauma they're carrying from having gone through that. And you have to be so determined to escape what you were living and to come here. But but at the same time, they were still the, the kids in at Brunswick High School. Patricia asked them about a dance that's kind of like samba to Brazil, but for Angola. And they, we were in the theater space, and they cranked up the sound and started dancing <laughs> spontaneously. Yeah. I mean, that there's oh. hope, there's joy. Yeah, and so yeah. much inspiration for you know. I, I've we've had some asylum seekers on this show before, and hearing about their stories, but also like how much they are eager to contribute mm. to building the community in Maine, yeah. to being part of the sports teams that their kids. Yeah. To starting a small business, I mean, it's a, 
overall a very tragic journey with a very hopeful end. Yeah. I mean, would you feel that that's what you're hearing? Absolutely, yes. I mean, and one of the boys we spoke to yesterday at Brunswick High School, uh, they were all proud showing us the trophy they got last year. They won the soccer, I think it was the state uh, championship. championship, you know. Uh, first time in, in many years, they were super proud. And, and also the way that they can be ve very pragmatic in very difficult situations. One of the girls was telling me that when they were crossing, there's, I mean, on top of everything, you know, crossing a forest in Panama and, you know, walking on foot, um, there's also a lot of, you know, people get mugged, uh, people get deceived by the coyotes. And so she was telling uh, that they got mugged uh, in the middle of the trip. There was, a, a, you know, a, a, a man gun to her head. And he asked for her dad uh, to give all the money they were carrying, right? Which was basically to pay, to pay the, the traffickers, the coyotes uh, along the way. And then the father gave the money. And I said, so um, that was horrible. She said, yeah was horrible but he knew that it was going to happen so he had the spare money in a different wallet <laughs> to give it when we were mugged wow. because we knew this was going to happen can you imagine that wow so she was mentally prepared but still no child should have a gun pointed at oh, their head horrible horrible, horrible. And the way she's processing this trauma yeah. this way you know almost making joke a joke about it. it's just wow it's yeah. i mean again it kind of like you're in, you're in awe of the human spirit yeah. In some ways, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, Patricia, I want to talk a little bit about your human spirit. <laughs> when you were um, attacked by a president, that can't be easy to begin with. But tell us a little bit about the journalism that you're doing and then what happened with the former President Bolsonaro and, and you. Sure. Um, besides covering, uh, you know, migration and, and uh, the topic of refugees, I also cover uh, internet regulation and disinformation. And I began covering this more uh, closely in the 2014 India general election when that led the current um, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi to power. Um, and he was one who was using social media in a very efficient way to try to manipulate uh, voters and public opinion. So in 2018, I was covering exactly that in the Brazilian presidential elections. And one of the things we revealed, like a se series of stories of how they were using voters' data to try to micro-target messages and manipulate voters, and how they were using automated like bots to send millions of messages on WhatsApp with fake news uh, Stuff like uh, saying that the the other candidate, uh, uh, the one who was running against Bolsonaro, was going to distribute penis-shaped baby bottles in kindergartens to indoctrinate children. Oh, it sounds ridiculous, ridiculous, but some people yeah. believe, and yeah. this was like everywhere. And so we did a, like some stories showing, you know, there's like businessmen hiring these assembly lines of uh, millions of millions of fake messages that are being uh, sent to WhatsApp groups. And WhatsApp, so, which is the app, the, the kind of the app like messaging, yeah. messaging app that most people use in Brazil. Exactly. I think here in the yep. U.S. you use more um, SMS, just text messaging. And yep. they're like 98 percent of the population is on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the Internet. Right. I see. Uh, so so the so the president's campaign was pushing out this misinformation to everybody's cell phone. Not the campaign itself. Oh, it's okay. Businessmen who were supporting his uh, campaign. Okay. So it's it's more tricky. Yeah, right? a, a, a little. But bit, it's yeah. still illegal. I mean, it, yeah. it was it was illegal. Some parts of it, but it really became illegal after the stories were published because then they changed the legislation. But what happens was that um, when I first started publishing the stories, I became the target of. Uh, uh, I mean, an online harassment uh, campaign that migrated to, you know, real world. So all things like fake pictures of me saying I was embracing the, the opposition candidates, saying, oh, this is the journalist. See, she's embracing the Workers' Party uh, candidate to also like false information that I had been sentenced to pay X millions because I was a liar to threats against my son, who was six at the time, to people calling mm -hmm. my cell phone saying I'm going to punch you in the face, up to the point that they were distributing my schedule of public events and um, inciting people to go there to confront me. So I couldn't leave my house. I, I needed a, a like a bodyguard with me. So And after all that, um, 
a few months later, or actually more than a year later, I mean, this all kept on happening and I kept on reporting and just, I was just silent, wouldn't do anything because I thought, you know, if you ignore this, it's going to go away eventually. Uh, mm-hmm. But then the president himself and his son, one of his sons, who's a legislator, um, said, I mean, his son said that I was uh, seducing sources uh, to get damaging information against him. Uh, And then that was the trigger for all kinds of politicians to be, uh, to think they were authorized to say that uh, I was a journalist who was offering sex in exchange for scoops. And the president himself uh, on live TV made a pun about this. And after he said that, like, my life was hell. I mean... What happened? uh, Ah, they... There were like millions and millions of memes and and videos, porn, pornographic with montages with my face on it, all kinds of horrible stuff everywhere. I I was getting hundreds of messages per day of people saying, you know, you deserve to be raped, you were whore, you're slut and all that. Um, And up until then, I had been quiet because I had this feeling that, okay, um, you know, this is going to go away, but it wouldn't go away. And that's why I decided I had to uh, sue the president and one of his sons. So you didn't just sit back. You decided to fight back. (laughs) Yeah, it was was not, I wasn't going to say, it wasn't an easy decision because, um, as you know, as a journalist, uh, the worst thing that can happen to us is become the news, right? Right. So I was really trying to avoid that and just keep on reporting. But it was unbearable when he was doing this maybe not that bad, but with other female journalists, it was a very systematic thing. It's 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 a, a, a field attempt to censorship, you know, to censor people. Because and and you to really... make them back down. Yes. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I sued him. We won. Uh, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. It uh, must have won... been a sweet victory, although quite a he, price to pay. Yeah, he's appealing, uh, but we won twice. Uh, but the, the mere fact that the judiciary system in Brazil ruled against the president in such an important case, you know, that means so much to women in Brazil was in itself uh, a victory. So let's dive a little bit into some of that harassment because, um, you know, there's harassment of journalists all over the world, but this had a particularly sexist um, angle to it. Do you, how, how is it for women journalists in general in Brazil? Um, I think I just have to say that this happens in the U.S. as well and under former President Trump. I mean, the way he was disrespectful towards some women and some women journalists. Uh, I know that he said some very bad stuff because one thing is uh, legitimate criticism, right? I mean, your story is horrible. You know, it's not accurate. It's bad reporting. uh, So this is fair and the audience, the readers, the viewers, they are our bosses. So we need to be held accountable um, by them. Uh, If we make mistakes, we have to correct them. If they're really bad and we get sued, we have to pay, right? That's not what we're talking about here. It's uh, whenever uh, a female journalist published, this was happening in Brazil and India a lot too, published something, uh, they wouldn't say this, your story sucks. They would say, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you're a whore, you offer sex. It was never about the work. And, And this is not, we can't normalize this. No. And, you know, I haven't had anything like what you've had, but I've been harassed that way also as a woman, just for being in a leadership position, um, you know, social media and different kinds of text messages. And it is very unsettling. And it wasn't death threats for me. We also know that some of our uh, local elected officials here, not journalists, but elected officials, particularly women, have been threatened um, for their service or for being a person of color. And it's a it's a really severe way of trying to silence some voices. Exactly. I mean, uh, I'm sorry you you went through this too. And I I can't imagine because, you know, being a woman, being a journalist, being a leader. um, And it is much worse uh, with uh, people of color, uh, LGBTQ plus. plus, Sorry, I wasn't very sure about the acronym in English. Um, And indigenous people, uh, because the minorities are very, uh, they're the most frequent targets. And it is a way to silence these voices. Uh, we know that social media, internet, this is the the modern uh, public square, right? Mm-hmm. This is where we're going to exchange ideas. So if you make this public square, this digital public square, so toxic, 
you're basically censoring some voices because you don't feel like, okay, I am a woman or I am uh, uh, indigenous. I'm not going to be, uh, I don't want to be uh, harassed, you know, so... And we need young people to become journalists. We need women to be journalists. We also need people to be running for office and local office. And so when that happens, you may not even know the impact because people just opt not to become a journalist or run for office. And that's a real danger to our democracy. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you kept going Like emotionally, when that's happening to you and you've obviously got to be somewhat scared, but you also, you know, you've got that calling that we talked about at the the top of the show. What was it that allowed you to, you know, step up and sue and continue to do the work that you're doing? Um, What you just said about, you know, uh, that we need to have women uh, running for office and um, and. I, I am afraid I think there is a chilling effect because of this online violence, and, and this is very sad. Um, so what made me uh, keep on going, keep investigating, uh, when uh, we have an expression in, in Brazil that is uh, to have blood in your eyes, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Not conjunctivitis, but something else, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, the more I, I published, the more I unveiled, uh, I, I was like, okay, so I have to get to the bottom of things. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop. If I stop, they win. But of course I was scared. And of you course. had your son who had yes. been threatened. And I, mean, I had that's my a... son and I had to, you know, call his school to see if he was being, uh, suffering bullying. Uh, I mean, there were several uh, things like my family. I felt very bad because, you know, they, they talked about my son. They talked about my father. Um, but at the same time, it just made me more um, committed to keep on investigating uh, because it meant that it was, you know, I was bothering them somehow. So there was something there to be revealed and I, I couldn't give up. Yeah. Well, I I know we have that same kind of grit here in the journalism community in Maine, Mm -hmm. and the uh, Portland Press-Herald is actually up for sale, and there's a um, movement afoot to try to start a nonprofit that could buy it. And we think at the Greater Portland Council of Governments, it's really important to have local journalism keep government accountable. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think journalism is important to democracy? Well, local journalism is essential for democracy. What we're seeing big uh, corporations or venture capitalists buying up uh, local newspapers and basically laying off half the staff. Uh, This is one of the biggest threats against democracy because if you don't have a local paper, who else is going to be um scrutinizing the local budget the city budget the city politicians right no one national newspapers or a big uh, tv chain, they're not going to do that and if they don't don't do that uh this is something that no one else is going to do this is the role of journalism right in in the best sense of it is to hold power accountable so um i i think it's very sad that this is happening and and i think uh Many people around the world are trying to come up with a solution. Is it, you know, a nonprofit? Is it a philanthropist? Um, is it, um, um, I mean, many others or the readers financing, like as members? Uh, it's it's um, the discussion of the sustainability of journalism in this new uh, environment in which uh, big tech uh, gets the most part of ad uh, yeah. digital ads uh, revenues it's it's uh, crucial well patricia it has been such an honor to hear from you and inspiration we're so lucky to have had you in maine um thank you for being here thank you so much for having me here uh, mainers and new mainers you're so nice <laughs> <laughs> and kathy thank you so much for bringing patricia here it's been a pleasure to have you thank you it's a very important program yeah well thank you so much um i also want to thank wmpg who collaborates with the greater portland council of governments in producing this show you can reach us on instagram at let's connect radio join us next week for another conversation about the great work that's happening out there until then be kind to yourself and to each other i'm christina egan see you next time on let's connect